This is Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with arrow 3271, lecture 23 on diagonal tension of flat webs. Imagine a truss attached to a wall. We just have these members shown, an upper and lower cap, a vertical stiffener, and two angled stiffeners. If you load that up with a transfer shear force, you can see that force is going to run down the one diagonal member and the vertical member. The diagonal member is going to carry a lot of that load. Some of the load will run up the vertical stiffener and also be carried in compression in the stiffener A. For low loads, this is how all the loads will be distributed. In fact, we studied this a bit in statics if we used pin joints this is the kind of problem we would have covered in statics it's just a trigonometric solution now as we increase the load more and more that rod b is in increasing tension and rod a will eventually buckle to its length due to its length now what's shown here it's not clear from the first picture picture a whether or not these are attached together what well, really what we're talking about is two rods unattached together except at the ends, pinned ends, and free to buckle. And if that happens, then this force will increase and distribute according to statics until that rod A buckles. When rod A buckles, it will tend to hold its buckling load with very little change, and any additional load increasing load increase of the P force will just load up rod B. Rod A doesn't buckle and fail usually. It buckles and continues to resist its buckling load. Now if we had a web, if we have those upper and lower caps and a vertical stiffness, stiffener, but instead of those two truss members, if we had a thin web attached, we would get a similar result where the web is going to basically be as you increase that load, that force, that's inducing a shear in the web. It's pure shear. But if you rotate your element, as we learn to do in our transformation of stresses, then we would find we're going to develop tension at 45 degrees and compression at 45 degrees. And actually that 45 degrees, I say that with a grain of salt because that's a function of the dimensions. If this is a square web, then it will tend to be 45 degrees. If it's a different dimension width to height ratio, then that angle may be different. But basically we're going to get tension, diagonal tension running from one corner to the other, and we're going to get diagonal compression running between the other two corners. Once again, for low loads, this will carry that load just in shear, and the caps will carry all axial load, and the web will carry the shear load. But as you increase that load, that force P, eventually that web will buckle. We learned how to calculate the buckling allowable of webs for a web of this size, the A and B dimension of this web loaded in pure shear. And once the stress in the web, the P over HT, surpasses the buckling allowable of that web in shear, then the web will buckle. What that means is its tension diagonal will continue to carry tension load and the compression diagonal will continue to hold whatever the buckling compression was on that rotated face. If we increase the load P beyond the buckling allowable, then this beam will continue to carry load. The compressive load on the compressive face will not really change. It will roughly hold its stress level, while the tension stress will increase, increase, increase. This is called diagonal tension since we find that the shear stress is carried in a diagonal direction in tension and in compression up to the compressive allowable. Now what we find is, testing has revealed, that these beams, while they might buckle, if the web is thin, it will buckle, often at a very low stress level. But the ultimate capability of this beam is significantly more than the buckling level of that web. If you account for the diagonal tension effects, we can predict roughly how much 
shear this beam ought to be able to take when it's loaded in a manner that the web buckles and shear but carries the load in what's called diagonal tension. That's what we're going to study today and we're going to learn the simplest method for evaluating this. This is a picture of a beam being loaded. This was back in the 40s, I think. They've attached it at the right end. You can see it's roughly a fixed support. And they have a actuator on the left, which means they're applying an upload. And as they have low loads, that would just be carried as a shear resistant beam and shear in the webs. The caps will carry all the axial load due to the bending moment, and the webs will carry the shear. However, if you increase that force at the end until the buckling allowable of these webs and shear is surpassed, then the, load, the beam will go into a diagonal tension effect. You can see those little ripples. It looks almost like those galvanized roofing sheets because you get little buckles in the diagonal direction carrying the shear and you get that tension stress developing from basically angle to angle. What we're going to be learning about is the basics, which basically means we're going to use a 45 degree angle. Now what happens is, so a 45 degree angle basically assumes that these, these panels are roughly square and it is for a certain amount of shear beyond buckling. If we get into the nitty gritty, we're going to find out that actually these webs can be carried at a number of angles. We're going to mostly focus our class on understanding 45 degree angles. We're going to learn a couple tweaks for any other angle and we're not going to go into the NACA method which is what most folks use to analyze this. The method I give you today actually can be used to size beams and evaluate beams in industry. And probably nobody will complain if you do that. In fact, some will be impressed. However, you should be aware that it's possible your company or your boss will ask you to use the NACA method, which is a little more a hocus pocus looking up in the figures and charts, but it's basically the same principle. So we're going to assume that the diagonal tension, regardless of the size of these webs, is carried in 45 degrees. With that assumption, that's going to keep these equations quite simple. And if you can learn what we're going to study here on this 45 degree diagonal tension, then you will be armed to do reasonable analysis out there in industry. And you will also have a good foundation upon which to build more complicated diagonal tension analysis in the future in industry. If you look at this beam, we've got a certain length. And what we're showing is the little spacing between the vertical stiffeners. If there was no vertical stiffener, then our beam would have a length 5D and a height H, and that would be the size panel we would evaluate for buckling. These vertical stiffeners, assuming that they have enough out of plane stiffness to break the panel uh, into separate discrete panels, make the panel size smaller so instead of a 5D by H beam we have or plate we have D by H plates which are going to have a much better buckling allowable. When we see this kind of problem we're basically going to assume that those stiffeners are sufficient to break that into little separate panels. Unless I ask you to check that stiffener for its resistance and then you'll go back to last lecture and use a little rule of thumb that I gave you then. With this all said, we have a beam that looks like it's 5D long. Our panels, effective panels, are D by H. We can actually calculate the buckling allowable of this. If we wanted the shear buckling allowable, we would say, well, the largest panel is D by H. We'd analyze an A over B ratio of H over D, calculate the shear buckling allowable, and then compare our shear stress to that value. But let's go ahead and assume that we already have a diagonal tension field where we've already buckled in the one direction, in one 45 degree direction, and the other direction is carrying the remainder of the load in tension. And let's focus on this little element that's circled up at the upper, uh, right about the middle of the beam there. We're going to once again assume that the flanges carry all bending and the shear is carried by the web. 
and that means the shear stress is just V over HT. This is how we analyze shear resistant beams and this is how we analyze diagonal tension beams. We start with this check. The shear stress in the web is just V over HT. Now when we use the NACA method it's going to give you a, a factor to increase the max shear in the web but we're not going to do any of that in this class. We're just going to use shear stress as V over HT. Now if we focus on this little element and draw a free body diagram, we see normally what we're going to have is the shear stress, which if we had a square element, which would be acting on all four edges. Since we've cut this at a wacky angle, that only that shear stress, Fs, only occurs along the top, as you can see here. So if we had cut a square element like this one, we would have seen shear stress on this web. But since we cut this element, we're going to see we have that shear stress still along here. But at 45 degrees, we have this distributed tension. And at another 45 degrees, we have that distributed compression. Now we're going to see momentarily if the stress in shear is V over HT, the force along this length, if this is a length dx from here to here, then the force is just that shear stress times the thickness and that length that we moved on. Now we're going to assume that this compressive phase carries zero. Now that's actually not true. That can carry whatever compressive force corresponds with the shear buckling allowable. If we take a panel of this size and analyze it for shear, we're going to get a F critical for shear for an A over B ratio of H over D. And what that means is at 45 degrees, the little element would have some compression associated with that and some tension associated with that. And it's only shear values that are beyond the shear that causes critical buckling that cannot be carried on this face. These two faces continue to carry the compression associated with F critical. We're going to neglect that to make our job even easier and assume that this diagonal face that's in compression carries zero stress. And we're going to force all of the stress to be carried on the tension face, which means we're basically walking into this analysis saying we have a beam. It's kind of like we have a beam with no web at all. All we have are wires that are attached like this at 45 degrees. If we had a beam with wires attached to these vertical stiffeners, this is the analysis that would be appropriate. And what we're doing is idealizing our thin web because it's thin. We're going to pretend it just stacks like a series of wires. Therefore, it can't carry any compression. It can only carry tension. And this analysis that we're developing here is appropriate which happens to be a gross simplification, but one that keeps the equations rather simple. Now from trigonometry, we can see if this angle is length L, then this vertical is dx over 2, and the horizontal is dx over 2. We can see that the cosine of the angle is this value, and the angle happens to be 45 degrees. We can write it this way. That means the length is just this equation, which basically means that inclined length is just dx over square root of 2. Now, what that means is if the stress on that inclined face is Ft, as shown here along line CB, then the force is just the thickness times the distance. And since the distance is dx over square root of 2, we see the force in that tension direction is just the, the tension stress times t times dx. So we can write our force this way. We can write the shear this way. And once again, 
we switched. Remember, we called this applied shear V, and now we're causing that, calling that little shear force along the element PS, right? We can see that the vertical is also that same stress. If we have that vertical stress, we call it FV along this length. Not only do we have the shear stress, but we also have this distributed stress that has to react against this tension. We're going to call that FV. And that vertical stress, FV, times the length and the thickness is the force in the vertical. So we have the force in tension. This is the tension force here. This is the compression force we're assuming is zero since we assume that compression stress is zero. This is the force along this face here and this is the vertical force along that vertical face. We can now sum our forces in the x-direction and we find that the tension stress in the web is simply twice the shear stress. So we see our shear stress is calculated in the normal manner and our tension stress is just twice that. When is this valid? It's valid if we have diagonal tension, pure diagonal tension we can call this, because the compressive face carry nothing, then we find, and if our angle is assumed to be 45 degrees, then this is true. So this is overly conservative because this compressive face, no matter how thin our web, will always carry something, which is going to reduce the tension stress that needs to be carried in these wires. But remember, our assumption is that these are just a, this web acts like a bunch of wires, and we call that a state a pure diagonal tension. Pure diagonal tension means this compression carries nothing. All of it is carried in tension. We, you're going to hear in industry the word semi-diagonal tension field, which basically means it's, it's taking account of the fact that this compressive phase can carry some of the shear, and therefore we're in a state of semi-diagonal tension rather than pure diagonal tension. Okay? Both of these analyses can be seen commonly in industry. And this is how we would develop the pure diagonal tension stresses and loads for a 45 degree pure diagonal tension state. We start by calculating our shear stress, V over HT. We recognize that the tension stress will be a maximum of twice that shear stress. And then we can sum our vertical forces and we find that the tension stress is also twice that vertical component of stress. What that means is that the vertical component of stress is simply the shear stress. So all we have to do is calculate our shear stress V over HT in the same manner we did for shear resistant beams. We note that the tension stress is going to be twice that value and the vertical stress is going to be the same as that value. So far so good? Great, let's move on. Now the first thing we're going to do after we've calculated those basic parameters, taking a look at a typical floor beam here, is analyze the, the shear in the rivets attaching the caps to the web. Remember we need shear continuity. We need a continuous load path from top to bottom. Otherwise this doesn't act like one beam, it acts like a bunch of separate members. We can see from our little diagram that along the line of rivets from A to B, we have two stresses. We have the stress due to the shear and we have stress due to the vertical force that develops. The horizontal shear flow on these rivets is just V over H. The vertical shear flow is a function of that QV, the vertical stress, but remember the vertical stress was equal, equal to the shear stress and therefore the vertical shear flow is the same as the horizontal shear flow for this 45 degree angle. Therefore our resultant on the rivets is a function of both the horizontal and vertical shear. Now with the shear resistance beam we had no vertical component. We only had V over H loading up those rivets, but because of the diagonal tension state we have a vertical component also, and we find that the resultant can be seen to be the square root of 2 V over H, so it's a little more. So this is our first design relation. 
once we have evaluated our web for the shear and our web for the tension we need to figure out what's the force developed in the rivets and it's square root of 2 v over h pounds per inch. How do we get the force per fastener? All we need to do is take the force or the shear per fastener is just going to be that shear flow times the spacing of those cap rivets. What's the spacing? It's this. It could be called the pitch, it could be called D, but we use D for a different thing. It could be called, just be called the spacing of the rivets. Now what that means is actually if you look at the spacing, half of the spacing is on this side of a fastener, half of it on that side, therefore the spacing is just this distance value that this picks up. So if we have a fastener and we have another fastener and another fastener, you can see along the line of fasteners you have the shear developing and the shear on each fastener is just that fastener spacing. Capital S is what we use for shear force and little s is what we use for that spacing. Got that? How do we evaluate the margin of safety? We would then just take the allowable of the rivets in shear divided by the rivet force minus one. Now remember that vertical stress that developed, FV? What that's doing is that's pulling, while it pulled up on the web, that means it's pulling down on the caps. And that means that the caps are being pulled downwards by the web. But the caps are attached to these vertical stiffeners. So as the web pulls the cap downward onto the stiffener, the stiffener resists that and develops a compression stress. We can call it P4ST for P stiffener. We also are going to see the nomenclature P sub V for P, this force in the vertical, okay? We can use this nomenclature little V for vertical, and we can use this nomenclature ST for stiffener. Don't be confused. I expect you to understand those and recognize what it means. How much compressive force is picked up by each stiffener? Well, it's just the spacing of the stiffeners because you're going to get half of the spacing from one part of the web and half of the spacing from the other part. And the total force is just that stress times D times T, which since that vertical stress is just the shear stress, we can write it this way. And that's just V over H times that spacing. Therefore, the stiffener spacing we can write this way. Either of these two approaches give us the same value. So the force per stiffener is V over H times D. The shear force on the beam over the height, the distance between the cap centroids times the spacing of the stiffeners. What's the compressive stress? You just take that stiffener force and divide it by the area of the stiffener and you could include some effective web or not when you do that compression. Now if that stiffener is in compression what do we check it for? Well you can check it against FCU. You can also check it against the buckling allowable of that stiffener. We would generally analyze that as a pinned pinned stiffener loaded in compression which is just the Euler buckling allowable. Now because that stiffener also might cripple, if we use the Euler-Johnson allowable and compare this to that value, that would be a better check. For example, if the force in the stiffener, the compressive force in the stiffener is given by this equation here, then the compressive stress in the stiffener is just that over the area of the stiffener. We can calculate the crippling allowable of the stiffener. We can use that to calculate the Euler-Johnson allowable of the stiffener. What is the length of the stiffener? It's just H of the beam from centroid to centroid. Or let's say we have a beam. Let's say we have two rows of fasteners holding each stiffener on. If that's true, then you can actually say, well, it's from the, between those two fasteners, between those two fasteners. That's basically the effective length of the stiffener. Using that, the effective length, the area of the stiffener, you can just calculate the area of the stiffener and the I of the stiffener. That's going to give us a square root of I over A, and we can calculate that. If you want to get a little more fancy, since 
these are attached to the web, we can actually calculate, well, how much effective skin is on that, and you can increase the buckling allowable a little bit by accounting for the effective width. Sometimes we will neglect the effective width just because it's a little easier, but if we need to, we can certainly include that and calculate that stiffening effect when we're checking the Euler buckling allowable of those stiffeners. Once again, we also do need to check that value against FCU and make sure it doesn't exceed that either. The next check we need to do is to check the rivets attaching the vertical stiffeners to the caps. Now, the web itself is in shear, but it doesn't have to transfer any of its load into the stiffener unless the load is introduced at the stiffener. However, in order for the cap to crush the stiffener, the load has to be able to transfer from the cap to the stiffener. It does that through the fasteners attaching it. So if we say, well, in this particular stiffener that's shown here, we can see we have one fastener, one fastener attaching the stiffener to the cap. Therefore, we would just take the stiffener force divided by that one fastener, and that tells us how much force is in that fastener. If we have a stiffener like this on a deeper cap, and let's say we have two fasteners, then now this would be two, and this would get half of that load would have to go through each. If we have a stiffener that has, let's say we have a, here's another cap, let's say we have a different stiffener, let's say we have four fasteners, now this N is four, and that tells you how much force per fastener. So once we've checked our stiffener for the force and stress as it develops, we check the forces that develop in the rivets or lock bolts or whatever else are attaching those uprights to the cap also to make sure those don't fail. So we've got what kind of words for these verticals? We call them verticals, we call them vertical stiffeners, we call them uprights. You could call them panel breakers. What are these called up here, the top and bottom? We call those caps usually. All of these are really fall into the classification of stiffeners. But we often call the vertical a vertical stiffener or just a stiffener and we call these upper and lower stiffeners actually caps because it's like the head and tail of the beam. Now we're ready to move to our next check. Let's just take the sum of the moments about point B here. And let's note that actually what we're going to do is call this, this is using Brune nomenclature, the upper cap has a force T. Now normally in aerospace we use a capital F to mean allowable stress. We're going to deviate from that nomenclature for a minute and follow what Brune did and we're going to call that a force. So we're going to call our force in the upper cap since that's tension FT and in the lower cap FC. We can sum our moments about this point B We've got the actual moment on the beam, whatever that is. We have the force in the upper cap, F sub T, at a distance H prime, where that H prime is, is the distance between the centroids of the caps. That's the same as H we were calling it before. There's a slight change in nomenclature. We then have this tension stress, which is at a weird angle. The tension stress, F sub T, acts on this vertical and it acts at an angle which we can write this way. So if we get the component, the horizontal component of that stress, the force that that stress causes at, and that's going to be aligned at half, half of that h distance, then we can sum our moments where this is true since we have a 45 degree angle and that is true so we can calculate what our, what this equation gives us. So when we go through this algebra and trig, we find that the tension cap is M over H. Now with a shear resistant beam, all moment is carried in the caps. That means the force, tension force is just M over H. But if we have a diagonal tension web, we're gonna now develop an additional force in the cap due to this diagonal tension. What's the force? Well, the tension cap will be reduced by V over 2 and the compressive cap
will be increased by V over 2. If you have a copy of EF Brune, you're going to want to fix his little typo. If you don't, you're not going to have to worry about this. So it's not that the upper cap has less force and the lower cap has more force. It's all a function of the direction of the shear. If we look at our beam, we see that the applied shear force, which is shown here, is acting in this direction. If we look at that, we can see that's going to be resisted by this moment. This vertical force, or transverse force, causes this reactive moment, which is carried as, as load in the caps. This, comp this cap is going to be in compression, and this cap is going to be in tension. Since the web has components of force like this and like this, horizontal component of the diagonal tension stress in the web is going to mean that the upper cap doesn't have to carry so much tension because part of that is carried in the web. And the lower cap is going to have to carry even more compression because it has to also resist this tension in the web. So what we see is whatever cap is in tension is going to not have to carry quite so much and whatever cap is in compression is going to have to carry a little more. If instead we had had a beam like this, we would have found the reactive moment to be like this. This would be our compression cap. This would be our tension cap. In that case, this cap gets that value and this cap gets that value. So it's not just upper or lower. It's a function of which cap is in tension and which cap is in compression. So what this slide tells us is how to calculate the cap forces due to diagonal tension. If we have axial load, then it's going to pick up axial load. If we have moment, it's going to carry moment. If there's a transfer shear, that means it's going to develop a moment that we can calculate how much force is associated with that moment here. If it's in diagonal tension, meaning the web buckled, then we also get this extra component of plus or minus V over 2 superimposed on those values. Now once again remember tension of the web is causing pulling on the upper and lower caps. This pulls the caps together and causes that compression that we see identified as P in this picture here. If we look at our piece of cap we have this component of stress pulling it down that was FV and we have these if we have discrete stiffeners what those are going to do is going to be pushing against that with what's shown as P in this picture that's P stiffener P stiffener now what also happens is this little distributed load due to the stress is going to cause bending of the caps now if we just look at this as a pinned pin beam okay pin pin beam where the pins are occurring at the stiffeners what we're going to get is a bending moment that changes right like this we're going to get a bending moment in the center and we're going to get a bending moment at the ends so we can look at the moment at the center and the moment at the ends that's what we're going to look at in this slide is what bending moment develops in the caps themselves due to the diagonal tension we can see that the distributed load is just going to be that distributed running load, the QV that we calculated before, V over H. Remember, H is just the difference between our centroids, and we're using the nomenclature H prime. We're going to get two values. We're going to get one value at the stiffener, one value between the stiffener. We see that it's maximum at the stiffeners for a pin pin beam, where we just plug in this Q sub V and we find this relation. We can do the same thing looking at a simple supported beam. Look at the central moment and we get this moment. So the moment is changing all through the beam as shown in figure 2 from Peary. But the max value is the ones we're concerned about. We have the value at the supports VD squared over H over 12 and the same value, one half of that, at the, between the supports. So at the middle and at the supports. These moments don't act alone. They also are superimposed on the cap loads we calculated on the earlier slide. Now if we plug in our P stiffener into this equation, we can write our max 
moments this way. Which one is greater? It's greater at the supports. The max value shown here is the value at the supports. The value between the supports is one half of this value. What moment is valid where? Well, the over 12 value is valid at the supports and the over 24 value is valid between the supports. How do we combine axial load and bending? We just superimpose those two stresses. Which spots need to be checked? Probably just at the stiffeners, unless your moment is changing and for that reason somewhere else is critical. Now we're going to summarize our approach for diagonal tension analysis when we assume a 45 degree pure diagonal tension field. We're first going to calculate our shear buckling allowable of the web as we learned how to do that before. That means we get the A over B ratio based on our stiffener and height of the beam where H is the distance between the cap centroids. Sometimes we'll just use the distance between the fasteners as a gross simplification of that. We calculate the shear buckling allowable for that A over B ratio. We then calculate our shear stress. We saw that that is given by just V over HT, just like a shear resistant web. We now check to find out if the web buckles. If our shear stress is less than or equal to the critical buckling stress, then there's no buckling, and we can just analyze this using the methods of shear resistant beams. If our shear stress exceeds the critical buckling allowable, then it does buckle, and we can analyze it as a diagonal tension beam. We can analyze it as a pure diagonal tension beam like we just learned how to do, or we can analyze it as semi-diagonal tension beam, which we're not going to learn in this class. If we have a diagonal tension beam, we determine the max tension stress on the web. If there's no diagonal tension, if the web doesn't buckle, there's no diagonal tension, what's the max tension stress on the web? Zero. Because this tension stress only develops due to diagonal tension. We can now write a margin of safety on our web tension just by comparing that stress to FTU. We then calculate the max rivet shear attaching the cap to the web. We saw this relation where V is our vertical shear, H is the distance between the cap centroids. Often we're just using the distance between the fasteners, the fastener lines. If you look at the fastener line of the caps, we can use that as H. That is not correct, but it's often approximately true and it's easy to find. S sub R, we've got a capital S sub R, that's our shear force in the rivets, and little s sub r is the spacing of the rivets. We can now write a margin of safety on those rivet shears. We then determine our max vertical stiffener compressive force. We call this P sub ST, I'm calling it P sub V here, where S sub V is just the spacing of those verticals. We then can calculate our compressive allowable of the stiffener. That means we calculate the crippling allowable of the stiffener. And then we use that to calculate our Euler-Johnson allowable of the stiffener. For our purposes in this particular lecture, we'll just pretend the stiffener acts alone with no skin and use the compressive allowable for that. But if we wanted to, we could calculate the effective width of skin and compression and use that too. We then write a margin of safety on that stiffener compression against the Euler-Johnson allowable. Obviously, we still don't want this to exceed FCU either. It probably never will, but you should also be aware to check and make sure it doesn't exceed FCU. The max shear of the fasteners attaching the cap to the vertical stiffener, where we take the number of fasteners attaching each cap to the stiffener, and we can write a margin of safety on those rivets. We then determine the additional force in the cap due to diagonal tension. Now this particular equation includes both the force in the cap due to the moment and the force in the cap due to diagonal tension. Once again, the compressive cap will get an increase in value and the tension cap will get a decrease in value. Don't be confused by the nomenclature. I've got a little P sub T here. That's just the force. It could be tension or compression. 
We then superimpose that on any other axial cap load if that exists and then we can evaluate our bending. We calculate the maximum bending moment. Mostly we're just going to look at the max value. We can also check it between the stiffeners. Usually we're just going to check it at the stiffeners. Now if we want to check the cap for failure we need to include both the axial load in the cap and the bending in the cap. That means we just take P over A plus MC over I plus or minus. And we can check that against our FTU allowable or FCU allowable for the cap. That's our basic approach for analyzing a pure diagonal tension field with a 45 degree diagonal tension angle. Once again, this is a little conservative because we assume that all of the shear goes into that tension component and the web carries zero compressive stress or force. Now to look at this a little further, we can note if we think about floor beams, floor beams are have people and cargo and galleys and labs and all kinds of things. So the major loads are generally down and the down bending case is much larger than the up bending case. We're looking at a down bending load factor of about 3.8 for commercial aircraft and of about 1 for the up case. Therefore the primary loads place the upper cap in compression and the lower cap in tension. Now we also get other load cases like we do have a load case for up bending 1G and we also have rapid decompression often that can cause an up bending load. So there are times when the lower cap will be in compression we need to be able to check that too. But the primary loads will be upper cap compression, lower cap tension. We're going to need to check them against the allowables. If they're in tension we check against FTU and if they're in compression we need to check them against the buckling loads. If the cap is constrained so it can't wiggle out of the way then all we need to do is check it against if it's in compression all we need to do is check it against FCU and against crippling. However, if it's not constrained, we need to actually check buckling as well. In that case, we need to figure out what are the end constraints. How often is it supported out of plane? If the entire floor beam has no supports, then it will buckle at a very low stress. If it's a floor beam, there generally are either shear panels, if you're out where people don't walk, or floor panels that are attached to the upper cap. That means the upper caps are often constrained against buckling out of plane. The lower cap usually has no such restraint. Sometimes you will see a shear web attached to the lower cap, usually not. However, there are intercostals often placed along the floor beam. So with floor beams, often what they, we use is intercostals. Any place we have a, a load introduced to the floor between floor beams, usually the seat tracks themselves, which are designed to carry forward loads, an intercostal is placed to take vertical loads. And these also serve to tie one beam to another. For example, if we have a floor beam in a fuselage like this, going from side to side in, in our thing, and another floor beam back here, the intercostal, let's say there's a galley or lavatory placing a vertical force at this point, we'd place an intercostal that ties into the two floor beams like this. What this means is if this beam starts to deflect, that is tied to this other beam and it keeps this beam from rotating without loading this other beam. So anywhere an intercostal is attached that will break up the caps. That means while a cap would have had this effective length now it only has that effective length. The other thing we do is we attach little straps below the beam. A little tiny strap like 050 or 040 about a three quarters of an inch to an inch wide that runs the length that gets fastened to the bottom of the floor beams down here running between multiple floor beams. What that does is keep this cap, lower cap of this floor beam from moving laterally without affecting this other beam so it ties them all together. Now none of these beams have very much torsional stability so what we do is run along the fuselage until if you look at a bunch of vertical floor beams like this if this is working if this is looking forward on an aircraft and let's say we have vertical floor beams like this we'd run this little cap along here and at the end either we 
attach it to a intercostal, which now allows that load to shear out, or we fold it down and attach it down to the next cap of the beam, which allows that load to come around that corner. Those are the two methods that we would, that are commonly used to restrain floor beams. So when we're analyzing the caps, we need to find out where they constrain. That determines our effective length. We assume that they're pinned pinned between those spots where they're restrained laterally. This first little bullet talks about the intercostal, and then this talks about those little thin anti-buckling strips that are often used. And then the way we would analyze it is for whatever length the beam is unsupported, we'd call that the length. We'd assume pin pin end conditions, and that's how we analyze those. That concludes analyzing pure diagonal tension for a 45 degree angle. Now if we get any other angle of diagonal tension, like if alpha is not 45 degrees there but something else, many of these equations will be slightly changed. The same basic approach applies, but some of the equations will change. The tension force in the web is now a function of that angle can be written this way. The tension force in the caps becomes this style U, where we now have this cotangent of the alpha, and our compression force becomes this one. Our stiffener load becomes this. Our moment becomes this. And there are other modifications to the rivet loads and things like this. Okay? A basic approach is the same. I didn't outline the entire approach for any angle. I'm just giving you these equations. So I do expect you to be able to give me what the tension stress in the web for any angle, or the tension or compression stress in the caps, the stiffener force in the moment. You aren't going to have to analyze anything else except being able to use these equations for alpha. But we are expected to know everything I covered for a 45 degree pure diagonal tension field. Got that? That's all I have. Enjoy.